So as emergency medicine physicians, we go through residency and train and continue to learn for the unexpected. Whatever walks, whatever walks through the emergency department doors, we're prepared to handle. But imagine me going to work and seeing my first patient and having them ask, him, ask me, are you a terrorist? I froze. I didn't know how to respond. I gave some awkward reassurances, finished the exam, and left. I wanted to say that no, I'm, my name is Kayvon Izadipan, I'm a proud Iranian Muslim, and uh, I'm your doctor today. I just shared my experiences with my co-residents uh, going back to the desk. Uh, we discussed maybe we should, we should do a dementia workup with this patient, trying to make a joke of the situation to make it pass by. But we continued care and got the patient to the disposition that she needed. But we shouldn't be so quick to diminish these experiences. Some, a recent survey in 2017 showed that 60% of emergency medicine physicians are exposed to some sort of bias. And in large part, it's underreported. And unfortunately, these experiences are far and wide. It not only affects emergency medicine physicians, but physicians in family practice, uh, surgical specialties, and all across the nation. Nowhere is it hit more home than for us in Charlottesville when our community was affected by the White Nationals rally in Charlottesville in August of 2017. Our community came together, but the nation as a whole was reaching a boiling point. Dr. Esther Chu on, uh, sent a viral tweet demonstrating the, uh, sharing a story about these experiences. Physicians from across the nation were quick to chime in on their experiences as well. But why is this experience so common? And what can we do about it? As physicians, we took a Hippocratic Oath to care for our patients regardless of what uh, sort of biases or what situation they might bring into the relationship. In the emergency room, we're in a sort of a, a special situation and doing a legal do -si do with MTALA, requiring a medical screening exam and informed consent so we don't commit battery against patients who don't want to be, don't want to be examined. How do we reconcile this with the Hippocratic Oath? A recent study, or a study in JAMA, put out a sort of guidelines for us. The crux of this is, is this an emergency or not? If it's an emergency, we do what, we're, what we do best at, and that's take care of the patient. But what do we do when it's not urgent? This becomes not so simple. That's when we use our, re, our, our negotiating skills and our ability to persuade the patient to get back in bed, to come out of the ambulance lobby, and come back to the bed so we can get them to where they need to be. Unfortunately, this doesn't always work, despite our best uh, attempts at persuasion. Sometimes patients have their own itinerary, and it may be filled with bigotry or hate. In this situation, the most important thing for us to do is set boundaries. What we need to, need to do for you in order to get this care is X. And setting these, up these, setting these boundaries and being firm is the best way to negotiate with these patients so that we don't have an MTAL violation and that we aren't committing battery against these patients. On the flip side, there may be some legitimate requests. We've all gone through, gone through the female patient who wants a female provider to do the pelvic exam. Or how about a Muslim patient who wants a female provider because of cultural issues. The main point is developing trust with these patients. But all this sets up for medical legal issues. Do we have any legal protections? The Civil Rights Act of 1964 has many titles, but they don't apply to hospital situations despite the protections for gender, race. And, and another important examination of this is our own biases. What do we bring to this patient-physician relationship? Many studies have shown that many patients across, across all races feel more, uh, feel more trusted against uh, uh, physicians who have the same race as their own. And it's not that we want to change our patient's mind, we want to get them to the care that they deserve. Our goal is to make sure that our patients are, are taken care of, and by doing so, we can understand them better. And lastly, I want to make sure I leave you guys with the impact this has on physicians. Dr. Chu's tweet set out a, a storm that uh, shared many physician experiences. And what's important here is that the burden that we carry can be significant. And physicians aren't equipped <coughs> properly to handle this. 60% of physicians don't even know whether their institution has formal process and many more than that don't even know how to utilize it. So what I want to make sure I leave you guys with is to lean on your department as a whole. We can take this issue on and spearhead it ourselves by leaning on our co-residents, our colleagues, our nurses, so that we are able to 
share our experiences, and not carry the burden by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Kayvon. Erica, you're going to be up next. And judges, do you have any feedback for Kayvon? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that incredibly personal and disturbing story that, that happened to you so early in your training career. Um, many, many of us have, have had other similar circumstances. And, and quite frankly, I didn't, I didn't get to see Esther's um, uh, tweet, but, but thank you for sharing that with us. It, it, as a call to action, what, what would you, if, if someone had an institutional, didn't have institutional resources, what would you recommend for them to have in terms of where would you want them to look and what would you want them to um, invoke in the institution in order to provide support for, for this type of interaction for a physician? Thank you. I'd just like to add that uh, I, I thank you for sharing your personal story, and uh, I hope it happens to you as little as possible. And you know, thank you for for being a great doctor. 